Hello, welcome to my lecture. This session was originally organized as an IEEE summer school, which was canceled due to COVID. Fortunately, it has been rescheduled as a tutorial session in the Triple M conference. But the bad news is that we don't have enough time to cover everything previously planned. My talk today is a very general introduction to magnetism, and I will be focusing on the fundamental concepts and the essential physical pictures of magnetic phenomena. Here's a roadmap of, of my lecture. This talk is focused on the static properties, namely the physical origin of magnetism, the formation of magnetization, and the ground state properties. The following talk will be focusing on the dynamical properties, where we're going to see how a magnetic system changes with time when being driven by external stimuli. So the fundamental building blocks of magnetic materials are magnetic moments. Historically, people used to treat magnetic moments in a very similar way as electrical dipoles, which consists of a pair of magnetic charges of opposite signs. Well, today we know this picture is quite wrong. It was Ampere who proposed a different picture where magnetic moments originate from circulating currents or current loops, not from charges. So from far away, the two pictures do not show any visible differences in, in the magnetic field lines stemming from the moments. But microscopically, we know that the B line, the magnetic field lines are closed in the loop picture, while they end on magnetic charges in the dipole picture. So besides that, uh, another essential difference between the two points of view lies in the angular momentum, which can be tested by the einstein de Haas experiment. So a magnetic material, uh, according to the design of einstein de Haas, is placed in a solenoid, where uh, we turn on the current, current and the sol solenoid produces a magnetic field uh, which polarizes the magnetic material. So the observation was that the system starts to rotate, indicating that the magnetization process is accompanied by acquiring an angular momentum. In other words, there is an exchange of angular momentum between magnetic and mechanical degrees of freedom in order to conserve the total angular momentum. So the einstein de Haas, um, de Haas experiment unambiguously favors the loop picture. So the magnetic moments are ended associated with angular momenta. So the difference between the two pictures can also reflect in the dynamical behavior, which, will, uh, which we will revisit in the following lecture. So here, I, let me compare a magnetic moment with an electric dipole. So even though the energy form uh, of the two systems look quite similar, the behavior of the moment uh, when it is uh, moved away from the, the equilibrium position is very different. So the electric dipole P is uh, going to oscillate back and forth around its equilibrium position, whereas the magnetic moment will persist around the magnetic field because the torque produced by the magnetic field is perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the uh, magnetic moment. And the precessional frequency is determined by a factor known as the gyromagnetic ratio. So by definition, the gyromagnetic ratio is the conversion factor between angular momentum and magnetic moment. So here, because electrons are negatively charged, its circulating motion, or the current loop, generates a circulating current in the opposite direction. Therefore, its magnetic moment is opposite to its angular momentum. In contrast, for nucleus, which are positively charged, the magnetic moments and the angular momentum are in the same direction. So for the general magnetic ratio gamma, we can actually work it out from a very simple picture. We calculate the loop current as the charge over the period of, uh, uh, of circulation and the magnetic moment mu as the loop area times the current. Then the gamma factor 
becomes the electric charge over the mass. Because the nucleus are much heavier than electrons, the nuclear gamma factor is much smaller than the electronic gamma factor. But in this talk, I will focus on the electrons only. So as we know that the angular momentum is quantized in integers of h bar, or the reduced Planck constant. So setting the quantum number equal to 1 defines the smallest magnetic moment that a current loop can carry. This is known as the Bohr magneton. The Bohr magneton is treated as the fundamental unit of magnetic moment. In standard unit, um, its dimension is ampere meter squared. So with the definition of Bohr magneton and magnetic moment, the magnetization, which is the central quantity of this talk, is defined as the volume density of magnetic moments. Okay? So we simply sum over all the magnetic moments within a certain volume and divide it by the volume. So the volume density of magnetic moments is defined as the magnetization. Okay? And the dimensions of, of magnetization turns out to be ampere per meter. So here I give the typical values of magnetization in transition metals, which is typically on the order of 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th ampere per meter. Okay. So from a thermodynamic point of view, the magnetization is defined as the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the magnetic field. So to have a non-vanishing magnetization in the presence of the magnetic field, the free energy must depend on the magnetic field. However, this is simply impossible within classical electromagnetism. We know that the Lorentz force uh, acting on the charge by a magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity of that particle, which means there could be no work done by the magnetic field. So a magnetic field is not able to change the system energy. Therefore, the partial derivative of the energy over the B field is zero. So classically, there are going to be no magnetization. OK, so the fact that classical electromagnetism does not support magnetization can be rigorously proved in thermodynamics, which is known as the Bohr van Leeuwen theorem. But today, uh, time wise, again, I, I won't go into the details of the proof. But a simple understanding is that when calculating the partition function, the magnetic field can be always eliminated through coordinate transformation. So the free energy is indeed independent of the, the B field. So, OK, classically, there is no magnetization. Then to study magnetism, we have to resort to quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, every physical quantity becomes an operator. So it's the angular momentum. And the angular momentum operator arrow satisfies certain commutation relations, uh, which is um, written here. So the orbital motion of an electron or a current loop is now specified by two distinct quantum numbers. And those quantum numbers are the angular momentum quantum number arrow, which uh, we know can take the natural numbers um, and each of the number corresponds to a particular orbital. And the second quantum number is known as the magnetic quantum number, um, which when the angular momentum quantum number arrow is specified, can take the value from minus arrow up until arrow. So physically, this represents the projection of the angular momentum on the, quant on the quantization axis. So besides the orbital angular momentum, uh, electrons also hold a spin, orbital, uh, a spin angular momentum. So the spin angular momentum is an intrinsic quantum effect, which has no classical counterpart. So the magnitude of a spin is one half of h bar. So here I, I just omit h bar. 
So the spin quantum number can be either positive or negative one half. So the orbital and the spin angular momenta are not independent quantities if we also consider the spin orbital effect, which is a relativistic effect in quantum mechanics. So in the presence of a spin orbit coupling, spins and the orbital angular momenta are not individually conserved but there are some where the total angular momentum is still conserved. So in fact, um, um, to, um, so in fact, a complete description of the, um, the angular momentum uh, of an electron uh, calls for four different quantum numbers. Say so the total angular momentum and its projection onto the quantization axis and the magnitude of the orbital and the spin angular momentum. And they are represented by four different uh, quantum numbers in the wave function. Okay, so this is a little bit of uh, quantum mechanics. So uh, if we consider both uh, orbital and a spin angular momentum, as well as the spin orbital coupling, of course, then we have a trouble uh, finding the general magnetic ratio. So again, this is a relativistic effect. The gamma factor of spin is twice that of uh, the, angle, uh, the orbital angular momentum. As a result, the uh, total magnetic moment and the total angular momentum are not proportional to each other. They point in different directions. Okay, so here in the figure, uh, the blue arrow is the total angular momentum, while the green arrow is the direction of the total magnetic moment, mu. And we, uh, we see that they're apparently pointing in different directions. So at this point, uh, we can regard um, the total magnetic moment as constantly precessing around the total angular momentum, j. So we are able to take a time average um, which amounts to projecting the, uh, the, the magnetic moment onto the total angular momentum. So we can use the projection as an effective magnetic moment, which is indeed uh, parallel to the total angular momentum J. So by doing that, we define the so-called lambda G factor. So the G factor, well, can be easily understood as one for orbitals and two for spins. But in the presence of spin orbitals, it can be, you know, can, can be neither two or, uh, nor one. So it is simply, um, you know, measures the proportionality between the effective or projected magnetic moment onto the total angular momentum, okay? So the G-factor can be very materials dependent. In different materials, it can range from, you know, from anywhere from two to even 10. So this is a um, materials parameter. Okay, so um, if there are multiple electrons in the atoms, then we need to first add up the angular and the spin angular momenta of each individual electrons to define the total arrow and the total s. So if this is true, then the spin orbit coupling uh, results in a so-called arrow s coupling um, in constructing the total angular momentum. So the arrow s coupling is true only when the crystal field is much smaller than the spin orbit effect. In other words, spin orbital coupling must dominating the crystal field. Otherwise, uh, the whole picture breaks down. Okay. So the LS coupling also comes with the, uh, the Hans rule to determine the total angular momentum, which consists of three principles in order. So, um, but today, unfortunately, I need to omit the discussion of Hans rule, even though it is really important. Uh, because of time limits, but you are encouraged to check back my slides after the, the tutorial where the Hans rule is explained uh, clearly on this slide. So, having introduced 
the quantum origin of magnetization. Uh, now let's talk about how magnetization uh, can react to an applied magnetic field. Uh, so the physical quantity um, of this is known as magnetic susceptibility. So magnetic susceptibility chi uh, is literally defined as um, you know, uh, the, the magnetization induced by a magnetic field or their partial derivative. But rigorously speaking, the magnetic field, which is usually denoted by H, is different from the magnetic induction, which we kept calling it magnetic field. So, but in fact, they are two separate concepts and they are related in this formula, which is the subject of electromagnetism. But uh, in this tutorial, we're going to not distinguish you know, the terminologies between magnetic induction and the magnetic field, uh, because in the linear response region, and if we restrict our attention to weak magnetic field and magnetization, then the susceptibility can be effectively viewed as the magnetization induced by the B field or the magnetic induction. So their difference only you know, results in the overall factor, uh, you know, slightly modifying the expression, but that is not important. So what is important here is that uh, in order to calculate the susceptibility, we need to find the free energy as a function of B field. Okay? So because the magnetization is the first order derivative, the susceptibility is the second order derivative of the free energy over the B field. So, uh, okay, in terms of the susceptibility, we can characterize the behavior of different magnetic, be uh, of magnetic materials. So first of all, the diamagnetism refers to the induced magnetization that opposes the increasing magnetic field. Okay? So when you apply a B field to the system, you create a negative magnetization. So the reaction is actually opposes, is actually opposing the magnetic field. So if you take their slope or their uh, derivative, then the susceptibility is a negative constant. So this is the diamagnetic behavior. And oppositely, uh, we can define the, the paramagnetic behavior or paramagnetic, uh, paramagnetism uh, in which a magnetic field induces a positive magnetization. So when you increase the B field, the induced magnetization first increases linearly until it fully saturates at a so-called saturation magnetization. Okay. So this is the paramagnetic behavior. And um, the next one is called the ferromagnetism, or the ferromagnetic behavior, which refers to the magnetization as a function of B field forming a loop. So this is called the hysteresis loop, which we're going to revisit in later sections. Okay. So for the ferromagnetic behavior, it differs from the paramagnetism in that even though you turn off the magnetic field, you still have a remaining magnetization. Well, for the paramagnet, when the B field is turned off, the magnetism also vanishes. So of, the, of all those magnetic uh, uh, behaviors in terms of susceptibility, uh, the diamagnetism is universal, but uh, in terms of the absolute values, the diamagnetism you know, diamagnetic susceptibility is typically much smaller than the paramagnetic susceptibility. So uh, in this tutorial, we will not discuss the diamagnetism. We will focus our attention to the paramagnetic and ferromagnetic behavior. So the, the, the key to find a paramagnetic susceptibility chi is to calculate the free energy as a function of B field, as we just mentioned. So first, let's take the simplest case uh, as an example, where the spin is one half, the smallest possible spin. So when we place a group of spin, paramagnetic spins in the magnetic field, 
then spin up and spin down have opposite Zeeman energies, uh, from which we can calculate the, uh, the partition function, which turns out to be a cosage function of B over T. Then the free energy density is the log of the partition function, where N is the volume density of the spins. So um, by taking the partial derivative of the free energy with respect to the B field, uh, then we get a tench function, okay? Um, and this is the plot here, so this is the tench function, okay? So we see that uh, when the magnetization is fully polarized, the saturation magnetization turns out to be the volume density of spins times the Bohr magneton. So at a small field, okay, uh, the magnetization increases linearly with respect to the B field. And the slope of this, uh, 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 of this curve for small B field can be uh, extracted by taking the Taylor expansion of the tench function. So then the slope of the small B field region uh, is known as the paramagnetic susceptibility, which is inversely proportional to temperature. And this curve is known as Curie's law. So um, the take home message here is that paramagnetic susceptibility, according to Curie's law, is inversely proportional to the temperature. Okay. So we can generalize the model and proceed with a larger spins, which usually includes not only spin but also orbital angular momentum. So we can just follow um, the same procedure uh, and calculate the free energy. Now the tench function um, becomes a much complicated function known as the brilliant function. Uh, so the brilliant function, even though this is very complicated mathematically, um, graphically it just looks like a tench. Okay, so here uh, I plotted, you know, the, 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 the brilliant function for different values of total spins uh, from one half to one to two all the way to infinity. So um, when, when the spin becomes one half, then the brilliant function reduces to a tench function. And when the spin becomes infinity, uh, it, is, uh, it approaches what is known as the, uh, the Langevin uh, function. But no matter what the spin value is, the curve just looks quite similar, okay? So again, um, uh, as, what, uh, as what we did for spin one half, we can tailor expand the brilliant, func the brilliant function for small B field. And again, uh, by doing so, we, s we can determine, sorry, we can determine the curious law of the paramagnetic susceptibility. So the Curie's law is quite a universal. So um, the, the, the paramagnetic susceptibility is simply inversely proportional to T. So the, diff the only difference between uh, systems of different spins uh, is the proportionality constant, okay? So here's a diagram of the uh, paramagnetic susceptibility across different elements. And we see it really spans a rather wide range, okay? So particularly, we are interested in those transition metals, okay? Those are transition metals. And we see that for uh, iron, cobalt, nickel, uh, the, sus the paramagnetic susceptibility can be orders of a magnitude larger than other transition metals. And so uh, at a particular concentration rate, the iron nickel uh, alloy reaches the maximum or the, the optimized uh, susceptibility. And this is known as a permaloy. So perm refers to um, a very sensitive, very susceptible, which means the material is very easy to polarize by a magnetic field. So strictly speaking, the permaloy is not a paramagnet, but it's actually a very soft ferromagnet, but because it's too soft, it can be easily magnetized and, you know, polarized by a very small B field. So the behavior resembles paramagnetism. 
Okay, so far we have ignored the interactions among different spins. Uh, namely, different spins are viewed as independent from each other, but in magnetic materials, spins are not independent, they are strongly coupled. And it is the exchange interaction among different spins that leads to the formation of magnetization. So in the following section, we're going to study the spin spin interactions or the exchange interactions. So the simplest type of exchange interaction is known as direct exchange, uh, where neighboring uh, atomic spins uh, have a direct overlap. So electrons can freely hop between neighboring spins uh, and play the role of messengers. So neighboring spins can communicate via those mess uh, messengers uh, or electrons. So the direct exchange can be determined by minimizing the Coulomb's interaction while respecting the fermionic statistics of electrons. So um, uh, in, 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 in simple words, we should uh, minimize the Coulomb's interaction while respect the Pauli's exclusion principle. And the consequence is that the total wave function, which consists of the spatial wave function and spin wave functions, must be anti-symmetric. So to realize this, either the spin components or the spatial component should be anti-symmetric with respect to particle exchange. So we only have a two uh, choices. So then minimizing the Coulomb's energy uh, can determine which one uh, have a, uh, uh, has a lower energy. So it selects out the spatial part of the wave function. Then because of the anti-symmetry requirement, the spin part of the wave function will be automatically selected. So um, as a result, um, well, even though the spins, you know, do not, you know, talk to each other directly, um, because they can only communicate via the mediators, and the underlying mechanism of determining the spin orientation is purely electrostatic, uh, which which is a Coulomb interaction, but the overall interaction can be expressed uh, effectively as a spin-spin interaction, and this is known as the Heisenberg form. So the Heisenberg, uh, Heisenberg interaction is uh, quite universal. Uh, regardless of the microscopic details, uh, the effective spin-spin interaction always ends up with a Heisenberg form. So here, depending on the sign of the Heisenberg exchange interaction, um, you know, we can classify materials into ferromagnet and antiferromagnet. So because the direct exchange interaction is very sensitive to the interatomic spacing, okay? So that's why different materials have quite different Heisenberg J, uh, you know, uh, uh, based on their interatomic inter spacing. So in comparison, um, the dipole-dipole interaction can also couple neighboring spins, but its magnitude is three orders of uh, magnitude smaller, okay? So it, uh, often uh, the dipole-dipole interaction only produces a negligible effect. So if electron orbits of neighboring spins do not directly overlap, spins can still talk to each other uh, via a, uh, uh, a, a non-magnetic centers, and this is known as the indirect exchange. So there are two different types of indirect exchange. Um, the first type is the super exchange, where spins can communicate through non-magnetic centers. Uh, so here, the oxygen plays the role of non-magnetic centers, where the, the p orbital electrons can play the role of mediators and connects the two neighboring spins. Okay. So super exchange interaction is a pervading mechanism in transition metal oxides, which are typically insulating materials. And almost always, the super exchange interaction leads to an antiferromagnetic coupling. So neighboring spins are rather preferred to be antiparallel. 
So another type of indirect exchange is known as RKKY interaction. So I here I just compare the physical features uh, of RKKY with uh, the super exchange. So while the super exchange is insulating material and non-magnetic centers are needed, in the RKKY there exists a conduction band. So spins can communicate through the conduction electrons, not the, you know, the mediating centers. So the conduction band as a whole serves as the mediator. And those materials, understandably, are metallic materials. Okay. So a fingerprint, uh, or a prominent feature of RKKY is that the resulting Heisenberg uh, uh, exchange parameter J exhibits an oscillating uh, feature. So here, I, uh, this is a plot a, uh, of the RKKY exchange uh, as a function of interatomic spacing. And we see that it fastly oscillates as a function of the interatomic spacing. So that means the magnitude of this RKKY is very sensitive to the, you know, to the crystal structure. If we compress the crystal or stretch it, we can even change the sign of the exchange interaction. And this feature, you know, uh, is what underlies a, a bunch of very interesting physical behavior. Okay. So if the mediator or the mediating electrons are also subject to spin orbital coupling, then besides the Heisenberg form, the exchange interaction also acquires a so-called zaloshinsky maria interaction, or simply DMI. So the DMI uh, depends on the cross product of neighboring spins. Okay? So um, when we exchange the two spins, then we got a minus sign. While for the Heisenberg exchange, uh, you know, uh, we got the same sign. So that is why the DMI is also known as anti-symmetric exchange interaction. In the DMI, the D vector is the key variable. Okay? So the D variable defines a plane in which the two spins uh, you know, favors a perpendicular alignment. So in comparison, the Heisenberg interaction prefers they are you know, either aligned or anti-aligned, while the DMI prefers them to be perpendicular. So the two mechanisms usually compete with each other. So in order to have a DMI, a uh, certain symmetry has to be broken. And specifically, the inversion symmetry in the crystal must be, be broken in order to have an anti-symmetric anti exchange. So to determine the D vector in real materials can be really difficult. But here, I would like just to list a few uh, simple examples. So here, uh, if the super exchange center, let's say the oxygen atoms, is displaced to one of the directions so that the atomic bonds now has a, uh, you know, a non-zero angle, then the dm vector is, is in the direction of the cross product of the atomic bond. So which in this case pointing you know, out, of, uh, the, uh, out of my screen. And a similar thing happens for uh, the interface. So on the interface, we know that um, the interfacial normal is a special direction. So because of this mirror symmetry broke, uh, breaking, the super exchange centers can be deflected, uh, just similar to, to this one. So uh, because of that, the d vectors is uh, it's a direction in plane, but in plane and perpendicular to the, you know, you know, to the lines connecting the two atoms. Okay. And here, well, this is uh, recently caught a lot of attention in 2D materials. So in a honeycomb lattice, um, you know, if, uh, let's see uh, what the DMI looks like on different, uh, connecting different spins. So, in the first nearest neighbor links, the midpoint is in the inversion center. So which means the inversion symmetry is not broken. So the DMI must vanish uh, on every first nearest neighbor links. But 
things becomes different when we consider second nearest neighbor links. So this point is no longer an inverse integer. So the environment is apparently different on different sides. So, and according to this rule, you know, well, the, this rule also, the DMR, DMR, DM vector is the cross product of these two bonds. So it is pointing again out of the screen, okay? All right, so with the exchange interactions, uh, spins in a magnet can be ordered collectively even in the absence of the B field, uh, which is known as spontaneous magnetic ordering. Okay, spontaneous means we no longer need a magnetic field to induce magnetization. Spins can order on themselves. Okay, so um, well. Um, the actual spontaneous magnetic ordering uh, is typically a result of the competition between exchange and other interactions. And based on the order parameter, well, on the, on the type of ordering, we can classify uh, magnets into the following uh, uh, categories. First of all, ferromagnetism, where all the spins are aligned uniformly. And the order parameter that characterizes this type of ordering is known as magnetization, which is an average of each individual spin. And another type is known as antiferromagnetism. So in an antiferromagnet, you know, the unit cell get doubled, which involves a spin up and a spin down altogether. So in this type of a magnet, if we look at it from, uh, uh, from afar, the magnetization simply cancels. But we can define, you know, within a unit cell, like the SA minus its neighbors, then this is known as the new order. Okay, uh, to memorize uh, Louis Nail, uh, a French physicist, uh, which is a pioneer in, in the antiferromagnet. So the new order def uh, characterizes the spontaneous ordering in this type of a material. So, and a third type is known as Ferry magnet magnetism, uh, which looks like an antiferromagnet, but the two anti-parallel spins have, uh, you know, uh, unequal magnitude. So in this material, both the magnetization and the new order are needed. And a fourth type of uh, spontaneous ordering is known as spin spiral. So um, the spin spiral, uh, you know, usually consists of a unidirectional spin of variations in space. And this is this material uh, is typically comes with the multiferroidal effect. But you know, because of time limits, uh, unfortunately, today we we are only uh, we will only focus on uh, one uh, type of spontaneous ordering, the ferromagnetism. Okay, so um, okay, so a straightforward way to study ferromagnetism is uh, also you know um, attributed to Curie um, with his colleague uh, Weiss. So this is known as the Curie-Weiss theory. So the we know that spins are highly coupled through the Heisenberg exchange interaction, right? So this is actually a highly coupled system. But the essence of Curie-Weiss mean field theory is that we can decouple the spins by defining a so-called mean field. So let's look at an individual spin, let's say SI. It interacts with all its neighbors, but uh, Curie Wise proposed that these interactions through Heisenberg exchange can be, you know, recasted into a mean field interaction. So after defining the mean field, which is proportional to the order parameter magnetization, then the spins are effectively decoupled from its neighbors. So uh, after the decoupling, um, a ferromagnet can be regarded as a paramagnet, uh, as if it it is interact with it is interacting with not just the external magnetic field, but a total magnetic field including the mean field. Okay, so 
the 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 mean field approximation you know ignores the spin fluctuations and this is how uh, the spins get decoupled so now uh, with the mean field picture uh, we can solve the ferromagnet uh, as a paramagnet interacting with the total magnetic field including the mean field so just to recall how we solved the, the paramagnetic susceptibility in the previous section. Now, the only change is that we need to in, uh, include the mean field. So a spontaneous magnetic ordering uh, actually corresponds to the solution with a zero B field. But because the mean field itself depends on what we are going to solve, so this has to be a self-consistent solution, okay? And we can solve this self-consistently uh, in the following graph. So the blue curve plus the brilliant function uh, when, when the B field is set to zero. And on the other side of the uh, self-consistent equation, the slope of the straight line depends inversely on the temperature. So at a high temperature, the slope is very large, then the only solution is zero. So there's no magnetic ordering. And at low temperature, um, when the slope becomes smaller, then we can have a non-zero solution, actually two non-zero solutions that are, are opposite to each other. Then, uh, you know, uh, when we tune the temperature, we can reach a critical point where the slope of the straight line on one side of the equation equals the slope of the brilliant function on the other side of the equation. And this particular point defines a critical temperature known as Curie temperature, okay? So the Curie temperature, you know, is the critical temperature separating a uh, paramagnet uh, from ferromagnet. So the Curie temperature Tc is typically on the order of a thousand of kelvins in transition metals, for example, cobalt and iron, uh, which converts to an extremely large mean field of a thousands of Tesla. So, well, that is so big uh, because the mean field actually is not a field. It simply represents the exchange interaction by ignoring the spin fluctuations. Okay, so according to the Curie-Weiss theory, uh, we can solve uh, self-consistently the magnetization as a function of t uh, for different spins. Okay, so for different spins, the curve looks actually quite similar, but the mean field theory uh, fails when we push to the zero temperature. So the asymptotic behavior of the magnetization when we go to zero temperature, um, you know, um, the, then the mean field theory um, does not agree with experiment very well. So experimentally, um, the magnetization disappeared as a power law, while the mean field theory predicts a exponential law. And their discrepancy is attributed to the uh, um, the ignorance of the spin fluctuations. Uh, and this is uh, one of the topics in the following lecture, okay? So, okay, so based on the Curie-Weiss theory, what are gonna happen if we add the magnetic field? Well, if we uh, call back the magnetic field, then the critical point uh, will be eliminated. Uh, and the MT curve, changes continuously across the Curie temperature. So, and this is because um, the straight lines in the self-consistent equation are shifted by the magnetic field. Well, this is a technical detail. Let's, let, me, let, let me proceed to the susceptibility. So, based on the Curie-Weiss theory, actually we can calculate the paramagnetic susceptibility above Tc. Okay, so this is a ferromagnetic phase, this is a paramagnet. And we see that the paramagnetic susceptibility above Tc diverges uh, asymptotically when the temperature approaches the Curie temperature. Well, in a pure paramagnet in which the exchange is completely ignored, 
the susceptibility diverges at zero. Okay. So the Curie-Weiss theory works pretty well in one D and I'm oh, sorry in, in in three dimensions, but in one and two dimensions the Curie-Weiss theory breaks down, and this is known as the Mermin Wigner theorem. And in those reduced dimensions, uh, in order to have a magnetic ordering, uh, the exchange interaction is insufficient, and we need to introduce the magnetic anisotropy in addition to the exchange. So this brings us to the next topic, uh, the magnetic anisotropy. So based on the physical origin, the magnetic anisotropy can be classified as the following. The first one, um, which is dominating, is known as magnetocrystalline anisotropy, which depends on the spin orbital coupling that entangles the spin orientation with a crystal structure. Okay. Geometrically, the uh, anisotropy uh, is the uniaxial energy term, uh, which means uh, the spins are, e uh, are equally happy when it's uh, being parallel or anti-parallel to, uh, to a particular di uh, direction. So, well, I should say that one, the anisotropy constant is negative, this is an easy axis direction. But when the parameter is positive, this is a hard axis, which defines a easy plane perpendicular to the hard axis. In materials, uh, when the hard axis exists, another easy axis usually coexists. For example, in nickel oxide, the 111 direction is a hard axis. So the 111 plane is an easy plane. Well, within the easy plane, the 112 bar direction is an easy direction. So that's why the spins are uh, lying in the 111 direction and pointing in the 112 bar direction. So uh, another type of anisotropy is known as the cubic anisotropy, uh, where the energy is, uh, it, uh, depends on the directional cosines uh, of the spin with respect to the crystal direction. For example, in Nikos, the 111 direction is an easy direction, and the 110 direction is a hard direction. Uh, so that's why uh, when we polarize a nickel, you know, if we do this along 111 direction, the magnetization, you know, uh, quickly approaches saturation. Well, if we do this along the hard axis, um, it, the, M, the increase of magnetization becomes much slower. So uh, another uh, physical mechanism of magnetic anisotropy is uh, the Doppler field effect, and this is known as the shape anisotropy. So just to, just to recall the difference between magnetic induction and a magnetic field. Well, the magnetic induction is divergentless. Uh, the magnetic field can be stemming from the, uh, you know, uh, where the magnetization becomes discontinuous, for example, on the boundaries. So the divergence of magnetization plays the role of artificial magnetic charges. For example, in a magnetic thin field, if the magnetization is slightly candid out of the, out of the plane, then it creates artificial magnetic charges uh, on the opposite side of the interface which uh, generates a magnetic field that tends to drag the magnetization back into the plane. Okay, so this is known as the, the demagnetization field. Okay, so the demagnetization field um, amounts to a hard axis perpendicular to the field. Okay, so that's why in thin field magnets, Magnetization usually lies in the plane because of the demagnetization effect as a shape anisotropy. All right, so uh, having very briefly introduced the magnetic anisotropy, a direct consequence of considering anisotropy is that the MH curve uh, becomes a hysteresis loop. Okay, so let's consider initially. Uh, I 
um, let's consider a non-magnetic material, then we polarize it uh, into saturation. But the, the interesting thing is, even if we now we turn off the magnetic field, there's a still a remaining magnetization known as remnant magnetization. So in order to fully undo the magnetization, we need a finite negative uh, magnetic field, which is known as the coercivity field, or simply coercivity. And if we continue to increase the negative B field, then we can reach negative saturation. And then if we sweep the, B, the, the, the magnetic field back and forth, we can complete the hysteresis loop. So the, 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 um, the hysteresis loop um, is a fingerprint uh, feature of both the spontaneous magnetic ordering and the existence of magnetic anisotropy. So no anisotropy, no hysteresis loop. It's that simple. So, um, you know, depending on the width of the hysteresis loop characterizes, characterized by the coercivity field, we can classify magnets into soft and hard. So like I just mentioned previous, uh, uh, moments ago, the, the permaloy is a very soft magnet, which means the hysteresis loop of uh, permaloy uh, should be uh, very, very thin, okay? So as the years goes on, uh, engineers have made you know, a wide range of uh, the corrosivity field. So now, a soft magnet can, be, can become very soft, and a hard magnet can become extremely hard, okay? So time-wise, let me uh, just skip the last type of anisotropy, which is known as exchange anisotropy, or also known as exchange bias. So, well, let me just briefly comment on it. So if we attach a ferromagnet with an antiferromagnet, then if we apply a magnetic field and you know, uh, suddenly cool down the material to below the ordering temperature of the antiferromagnet, then we can shift the loop to one of the directions dictated by the applied magnetic field. And the shift of the hysteresis loop is known as exchange bias. So the exchange bias effect is still an open question. Okay. So the actual magnetization process, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the move on the loop is actually more complicated than we expected. So the actu what actually happens uh, consists of the domain wall motion. So the magnetic materials can break into multiple domains. And in the presence of a magnetic field, the domains with the same direction as the B field will continue to grow and finally eat out, eat out um, uh, you know, the other domains. So eventually, um, uh, some domains expanded and swell up and becomes you know, uh, divergent and other domains will be, you know, eliminated. So the magnetization process actually, uh, you know, involves the domain, uh, domain wall motion. So the boundaries is known as domain wall. Okay. And now the domain wall brings us to the last topic today. So um, the domain walls, uh, well, in order to, to see why there's the domain walls, we, well, we, we need to, again, look into the energy competitions. So the exchange uh, interaction prefers uniform spin orientation, but the dipolar interaction favors opposite spin uh, directions. So the two mechanisms actually compete. In small systems, the exchange uh, interaction wins because it is much stronger than the dipolar interaction. However, in large systems, the dipolar, uh, dipolar interaction can win the competition because it is a long-range interaction, while the exchange is actually a short-range interaction, only between neighboring atoms. So here is an illustration for a very large magnet you know, the magnet, the dipole-dipole interaction, you know, prefers the magnet to breaking into different domains. So by breaking into multiple domains, then we can actually minimize the dipole-dipole interaction, even though we paid 
energy penalty for the exchange interaction on the domain walls separating different domains. So if we zoom in on the boundaries separating two domains, then we get a smoothly varying spin texture known as domain wall. So to solve the domain wall profile, then we need to go into the continuum limit, uh, which uh, I would like to leave as a homework uh, problem for you to, to practice. Okay. So let me just uh, jump into the conclusions of the, uh, the profile of the domain wall. So this is a typical soliton profile of a magnetic domain wall where the lambda is known as the domain wall width which is the square root of the exchange interaction over the anisotropy okay so um, the domain formation is a result of the competition between exchange and the dipolar interaction but to determine the specific profile of the domain wall the uh, the exchange actually competes locally with the anisotropy, and their competition determines the domain wall width. So um, I believe that in the Triple M conference, we will, you will be repeatedly encounter the concept of a block walls and the new walls. They are two fundamental uh, types of domain wall solutions. So in the block wall, you know the spins continuously uh, change its orientation within a plane uh, perpendicular to the moving direction. Well, in the new world, the spins changes within the plane that is, involves this, uh, the, the, the direction connecting the two neighboring domains. Okay. Uh, so this is the last slide and I have, I'm running out of time. So uh, the domain wall can be actually regarded as a one-dimensional topological defect. And in that sense, we can generalize the idea of magnetic domain wall into higher dimensions. Okay? So in two dimensions, um, the topological defects can come in the form of magnetic vertex and the magnetic skirmia. So uh, simply speaking, for a magnetic vertex, the magnetic spins are restricted to, uh, in the plane, except at the very center. Well, for skirmions, uh, the, ma the magnetic spins uh, is allowed to pointing in any direction in space. And there's no, you know, there's no singularities in the center. So this is some 2D magnetic skirmion. And in 3D, things become more complicated. Uh, so we can have a magnetic monopoles and uh, the recently proposed the Hopfions. But I, I, I'm not going to you know, go into um, uh, those topics. I just listed here uh, so that you, you may encounter those concepts in the Triple M conference. So lastly, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. And here I listed a bunch of textbooks recommended for graduate students in this field. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I hope you have enjoyed my talk. Thanks very much.